At the heart of what we do at Westminster Presbyterian Theological Seminary is training preachers. So I would like to think with you about biblical and practical issues in training preachers. Charles Bridges locates the Christian ministry and preaching in particular in the purposes of the triune God. He wrote, tracing therefore this sacred ordinance to the footstool of the eternal throne, with what prostration of soul should we bind ourselves to its solemn obligations? So this obviously means that our subject is of great importance. Preachers need to be properly prepared for their task. Bridges again writes, the weight of ministerial responsibilities renders the work apparently more fitting to the shoulders of angels than of men. It is therefore a matter of the deepest regret that any should intrude upon it, equally unqualified for its duties and unimpressed with its obligations. Though many see little necessity for preparation here, if ever, Labor, diligence, observation, and intelligence are needful to produce a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So we're going to proceed to consider, first of all, the biblical basis for training preachers, and secondly, practical issues in training preachers. So first of all, the biblical basis for training preachers. And the pastoral epistles are, of course, a go-to portion of Scripture when it comes to issues surrounding the pastoral ministry. Second Timothy, Paul's last letter, has particular urgency. And there in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he writes, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. This imperative of verse 2, preach the word, is really the content and burden of these opening verses. The weighty charge of verse 1 and what follows afterwards are all supporting this stark statement. If there is one thing, the minister must not leave undone. It is the preaching of the Word. But our focus for a few minutes is on 2 Timothy 2 verses 1 to 2. And Paul here is dealing primarily with the great and supreme value of what the apostle taught. Described in chapter 1 verse 14 as the good deposit. And that is still his concern when he writes in chapter 2 verse 2, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men. These things he's referring to are the pattern of the sound words and the good deposit that he has mentioned at the end of chapter 1. To the end, however, that the apostolic message is passed on, verses 1 to 2 also show us what one commentator calls the earliest traces of a theological school. And the picture here of Paul's vision for a seminary gives three essential priorities in the training of all preachers, regardless of how that training is done. Firstly, preachers must be strengthened by grace. It's foundational that preachers be savingly united to Christ. And Paul here, as everywhere, sees our salvation through the lens of union with Christ. 
In chapter 113, he wrote, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And then here in verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So we must be as sure as we can be that anyone who would preach is in Christ. We are in Christ by God's grace. Therefore, Paul exhorts Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We're only Christians at all by grace. Preachers can only carry out this most privileged and awesome task by the grace of God. So a first step in biblical training for preaching is to be united to Christ and to be growing in his grace. Secondly, preachers must search out faithful men. Verse 2, 2 Timothy 2 says, And the things you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men. The things Timothy heard from Paul are, of course, the doctrines of the faith, the good deposit. And Timothy had heard these among many witnesses. In other words, these were public truths. They weren't some deep, secretive teachings. And these were to be taught to all God's people. These truths were to be committed to faithful men. So preachers are stewards of God's truth. They don't invent their own message. They convey God's message without changing it. Hence, we must be on the lookout for doctrinally reliable men to be preachers. Such men are described in Titus 1 verse 9, which is the motto text of our seminary, WPTS, as holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So faithfulness requires boldness and courage. And here we see Paul envisaging a, a chain of faithful men making known the gospel. Christ himself had revealed the gospel to Paul as an apostle. Paul taught Timothy. Timothy was now to commit the apostolic truth to other faithful men. And then thirdly, these faithful men should be able to teach others also. That's how verse 2 ends, who will be able to teach others also. This isn't saying that we must train preachers who will be conference speakers or seminary professors. The Greek word is hikanoi. It's translated in 2 Corinthians 3, 5 as sufficiency. Our sufficiency is of God. So preachers must train preachers who are made sufficient by God to teach others also. So this text envisages four generations of preachers being trained up. We have Paul, to Timothy, to faithful men, and to the others that they will train. There is multiplication of preachers if each of these in their ministry identify one or two others. And so we should continue this process today. This is true apostolic succession. We strive to secure the handing on of the apostolic gospel. And we do so through training faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Thinking three generations ahead, as Paul did here, can secure faithful ministry for a long time. So the future health of our churches depends on training biblically faithful preachers. And here we have a model for doing so. Preachers must be strengthened by grace. 
preachers must search out faithful men, and these faithful men should be able to teach others also. But let us consider for the remainder of our time practical issues in training preachers. Practical issues in training preachers. And we'll consider in particular training in the local church and more formal theological training. These must always go together. So first of all, training in the local church. Arising from the text we have looked at, we see that we need to identify potential men in a local church context. There's an outward call from the church as well as a man's inner call, and, and these both must be evident. Spurgeon said that if we can stay out of the ministry, we should. Lloyd-Jones said in the, the last century, no man should go into the ministry if he can stay out of it. It's been a standard in many of our churches. And yet we do need to be proactive in approaching some who have not perhaps approached the elders, be they young men or men who are a bit older or whatever. And we then need to invest time in their training within the local church. And that might mean that we should take minor risks, perhaps open Bible studies and so forth. And it might not be as good as our minister normally is in whatever our churches are. But yes, this, this is vital for testing, gifting, and calling. And if nothing else, at will, as Spurgeon says, prevent the further public exposure of rampant ignorance. And the greatest role that training in the local church plays is perhaps through example. In 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 11, Paul tells Timothy, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. Our example as preachers help to train other preachers. Our own preaching efforts, weak though they may be, if they are faithful to the word and earnest in their delivery, they form an example and may actually provide better training in preaching than a college or seminary can. But nevertheless, there's a need for formal theological teaching, and I'll turn to that now. Formal theological training. There is a need because the subject of theology is the infinite God. So it will always be the most exacting discipline. Regardless of how the training is done, we can all agree that a man should not enter the preaching ministry who lacks proper training and good habits of study. God can, of course, miraculously gift the virtually illiterate. He can help those of us who are preachers to speak well when hard-pressed and lacking time to prepare, but we cannot presume on these things. So there may be many practical barriers to formal study, but all who would preach must be diligent, 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to Present yourself, approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Theological training can never be undervalued. So far as resources allow, if you're thinking of ministry and training, do all the study you can. 
support others to do as much as they can. Yet, this theological training must produce preachers. In a lecture by Dick Lucas on training for preaching ministry, he makes the point that colleges are often failing to produce preachers of note. Many are being produced who are theologically and exegetically precise, but boring and unable to apply the message to the comfort and challenge of their hearers. So practical training in preaching is vital. This again is where the local church is so important. This gives a very real opportunity for preaching and feedback under the pressure of the normal weekly cycle of church life. But what is of great importance in the seminary itself, whatever seminary it might be, is when lectures lecture and expound God's word in a living way. Such training produces preachers. Lucas in that lecture refers to lectures that took place in Scotland in the 1930s, which it was reported were a form of rational worship. Some students were converted, others were challenged to the core of their being. And it was said, we often felt we were in a sanctuary where the holiness and nearness of God were indistinguishable. Now, the man giving those lectures, I can't vouch for him one way or another theologically, but is that not the kind of lectures that we need? J.I. Packer reminds us theology is for doxology and devotion. That is the praise of God and the practice of godliness. So the best possible preparation for preaching is to have thoroughly orthodox men who are themselves preachers, training preachers. Lectures are needed but they're at their best when the lecturer can hardly help himself from preaching the truths that he is teaching on. And here at WPTS, we have a faculty who are all preachers and serving or retired ministers. Nearly all have been involved in church planting ministry, and this we believe is our greatest asset. So the best way to ensure good preachers are being produced is when seminary training is done in close partnership with the local church. We can then hope that good examples of preaching are constantly modeled before the eyes of those training to be preachers. Let me then just give three applications that are applicable to any of you watching who are preachers and indeed to all Christians who are rightly concerned about these things. Firstly, be on the lookout for potential preachers. We must pray the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest, and yet also proactively be on the lookout for those who could preach. We shouldn't just be passive in the hope that someone will turn up. Be on the lookout. And then secondly, pray for the seminaries. Pray that seminaries would remain faithful. False teaching doesn't present itself as such. It can appear very 
plausible, it's subtle, it can easily infuse our minds and lead us to distort the truth. The late John L. Mackay, late principal of Free Church College in Edinburgh, speaking on the false prophets of Micah's day, has said, history has shown that no institutions can degenerate as quickly as theological colleges. So pray the seminaries would remain faithful and pray too for seminaries to produce able preachers and pray above all that the lectures in our seminary and in the seminaries across our land would be characterized by a sense of the holiness and nearness of God and that a desire for God's presence would undergird the whole ethos of the best seminaries. And then lastly, pray for preachers. Pray that we preachers would be examples in our preaching, in our doctrine, in our manner of life. As we are such an example, then young men or older men will look up to us. And if God calls them to preach, they will already have received a lot of unconscious training. Perhaps we're in small and weak church situations and we feel the limitedness of our gifts. But may God help us to preach and to live in an exemplary way. And as you pray for us preachers, and then as we engage in this way in our own preaching ministry, God may well be pleased to raise up other preachers. Thank you for listening.